From the unspoiled beauty of white sand beaches to Florida's lush natural preserves, visitors can experience the breathtaking beauty of the Bradenton area, a truly unique destination. Visit BradentonGulfIslands.com to plan your next trip. This variant is insubordinate, stubborn, unpredictable. You need the god of mischief. you go it's just death destruction the literal ends of worlds okay. change change maybe loki wants to mix it up is that possible you can change i am loki and i am burdened with glorious purpose Hello and welcome to Still Watching Loki for episode four. I'm Betty Fair senior writer Joanna Robinson. Something has happened to Richard Lawson this week. He has been zapped into potentially some alternative dimension. Uh, uh, jo- which- Joe, we got to level with the people. Richard was a variant. And he, had uh, to, he had to be proved. He had to go. He had to go. No, uh, Richard, Richard's been zapped away. Um, <laughs> we, have and kid, we have Kid Richard and Lizard Richard <laughs> who will be joining us. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but we, uh, which means, uh, and actually, honestly, Richard might be gone for the rest of the season because he's off to Cannes and we're unsure if we can make sort of the international schedule work out. So we might have uh, lost Richard, uh, but we have gained m- even more Anthony Bresnikin. So yes. that is that is a true joy for me. Hello, Anthony Bresnikin. How are you? Oh, good. I, sh- I jumped in even before I was introduced. Hey, everybody. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> um, it's good to be with you, Joe. Um, so usually what we do on this podcast is we, you know, what Richard and I pick a show, we break it down every week, we get a little nerdy about it, a little granular about it. Um, and then Anthony comes at the end to get even nerdier and comic book and all that sort of stuff. But yeah. Anthony, uh, can, it can wear all the hats. So basically we're going to, we're going to have that first section where we talk about sort of the series as a whole, maybe some sort of bigger, how it fits in like the TV landscape questions. And then we're going to take a break. We've got an interview, great, long, juicy interview with uh, director Kate Heron, series director Kate Heron, um, which you'll hear in the middle of the episode. And then Anthony, and I, we'll, we'll be back. We'll be back again to talk um, a little bit more about some forward looking stuff, some theories, some comic book stuff. So that is how the show is going to run today. We're going to pepper in some emails. Still watching pod at gmail.com is where you can find us. We got a bunch of great episode uh, for emails today because. You and I are recording a little later, Anthony, and because I uh, I put a call out on Twitter, we got a bunch of like episode four emails, so we will we will talk about them. But I want I want to I want to start with you at the end of the episode, and I just want to tell everyone listening: if you haven't watched episode four yet, the Nexus event directed by Kate Heron, written by Eric Martin, you're gonna want to go do that, and you want to make sure you watch the mid credit sequence because mm-hmm. that is very vital. And that is what we're going to talk about right now. <laughs> so if you haven't watched it yet, if you're like, oh, there was a mid credits, go watch it. P- press pause. Yeah. Go watch it. And then come back. And, and that's what we'll we're wait. going to talk about. We'll wait for you. Time we'll has be- no meaning. Here. <laughs> uh, at the podcast VA. Um, all right. So ready? Are we ready? Here we go. We're going to talk about it now. All right. So I just want to say, Anthony, that when first Mobius got zapped and then Loki... I was like, yeah, no way these guys are dead. Like, no, 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 no way. No way, yeah. not in a million years. Like, maybe Mobius. But I was like, I don't think, I don't think so. And so uh, I, I got a little frosty as the credits roll because I was like, oh, are they going to do a, are they going to try to do a fake out death for a week? Because that's going to make me really mad if Tom yeah. Middleton has to like go around and like pretend that he's no longer on the show. Yeah, or guys, it was a good run. But All you right. know. <laughs> <laughs> that stuff just really bothers me. And then they gave us the mid credits. I was like, oh, phew. Thank goodness. Like, we don't have to deal with that. So, uh, uh, Anthony, can you describe what we see in the mid credit sequence here in Loki episode four? Kind of a lost vibe. Didn't it remind you of a little, oh, a little bit of Jack in, sure. in waking up in on the island? Sure. I can, I can, I can feel it. I can you feel know? that. So he, uh, Loki wakes up and there's no Mobius, but he hears a voice. And I think, you know, essentially another movie reference, Terminator 2, come with us. Like, <laughs> and he looks up, and there's Kid Loki, 
and uh, what is being called uh, old Loki, if you're salty, classic Loki, if you're uh, if you're feeling generous. Uh, but it's uh, Richard E. Grant in a kind of a baggy but comic book uh, adherent co- costume. The original, of Loki. the original Loki costume. Yeah, yeah, the yellow and green, the bright yellow and green. And then we have Diobio Opari as what I guess we're calling Boastful Loki, right? That's what the credits called him, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what the credits called him, Boastful Loki. But he's got an interesting, like, hammer, and the hammer looks like uh, part of an iron bar that you would have, like, in construction. (laughs) That's what it looked like to me. Uh, I'm not quite sure what those things were that were on the top of it. I got a pause and freeze frame and zoom in rotate 360 degrees but there's a fourth loki which um i believe esquire did an expose on today is it crocodile loki or alligator loki and i think they settled (laughs) on alligator loki yeah uh i like gator loki but i've heard i've heard croc gator lizard loki uh uh, at any rate this is a non-humanoid loki reptilian loki (laughs) yeah we're safe uh and did you notice the background? Oh, like, I sure you... did. So sure that's did. Avengers Tower, right? Yeah, yeah, in ruins. 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 So New York City and Avengers Tower just decimated, and these four offbeat Lokis. <laughs> it's like, um, uh, I have to say that uh, Yobia was the only one who looked like he, and maybe Kid Loki was the only one who could handle himself. The other two looked like they were lost, but. <laughs> Classic Loki, it's funny because Rishi Grant has like sort of assumed this kind of crouching position, but that's how Loki was drawn like at the beginning in this weird like sort of bent over crouch sort of position and and that and that like baggy little uniform on him. Yeah, so um And what's Kid Loki the actor's name? Jack Beale. And like we knew he was coming like he's been that kid has been posting on his Instagram account like they let him say like he was in Loki, so you know we knew this was coming. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's got the little uh, a, a, a class original Avengers uh, Loki hair flip, like the flipped <laughs> Loki hair uh, that we got uh, from the first Avengers movie. Um, yeah, the the hammer that boastful Loki has um, looks like uh, someone pointed out that it looks like parts of a like it looks like a railroad tie uh, or right. like a railroad track. And that the handle kind of looks like a part of the piston of a steam engine. Oh, that's kind of so neat. So I'm like, is this steampunk, Loki? <laughs> like, I, I would be into that. Um, but but the bottom line is, like, what we've learned is that when you get pruned, you don't necessarily die. You get dumped in, like, a pocket dimension. Um, and are does everyone get dumped in the same pocket dimension or is there like just one pocket dimension for you, for Loki's and one pocket like is Mobius in a pocket dimension with like a bunch of uh, Owen Wilson's like that would be really fun. Um, but the point being is we have a we have a league of Loki's now um, and uh, they are going to try to, you know, uh, do what Loki's do escape. And I've got some big thoughts on that, which we'll get to after later in the episode. Um Based on some trailer shots, but uh, yeah, it's exciting to see this. I'm I'm happy to see Kid Loki. He's here. You and I read a, uh, some Kid Loki comics in preparation, so that's really fun. And um, it does kind of blow a hole in in my uh, my big <laughs> my big idea that Richard E. Grant was like behind everything at the TVA. Uh, instead, it just seems like we're just gonna get like classic Loki, which is fun. I'm I'm. I'm not mad about it. I'm I'm here for it. So yeah, the other you mentioned Lost, and and that's a good that's a good comparison. The other one that um I was thinking of is that it's a lot like that shot at the end of the Avengers, all the Avengers gathered around Loki that we saw in episode one of Loki, right? Where like it's Hawkeye and Black Widow and Thor and Cap and Iron Man all looking down at loki oh yeah yeah Yeah. you're right right. yeah so it's but it's a bunch of loki's instead which is fun um so so yeah here here they come the league the league of loki's um and i that's a good callback joanna really good sharp eye like and and i think i think it thank you and i think it means that uh mobius isn't dead i think he's just been that's somewhere you know he, he got a nice departure there and i, I but I, there's still more to come from him i'm absolutely certain 
I wanted to revisit, um, this is something I was planning to do with Richard. So it is, this is not based on uh, your opinion of episode three, but I wanted to revisit this like critique of episode three, that it was like a filler episode. And I, I want, I want to like, uh, you know, you, you weren't a big fan of episode three. I have heard from a, a number of other people who weren't a big fan of episode three and they had critiques that I like yours that I found really reasonable um, so really, I'm just addressing like in a more unreasonable critique, yeah. not your more nuanced take on can, it, if that can, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just say something? Like, yeah, like, yeah, of course. Like, <laughs> I um, I was really depressed to see that people were hating on the episode for bad reasons. And like, if I had known that, I probably would have modulated my feelings a little more. I just didn't realize that, uh, you know, I, I don't I don't dislike the episode as filler. Uh, there were just aspects of the story that didn't, that I felt didn't work. So, yeah, exactly. Usually, no. usually I'm much more upbeat about things, and, uh, and but you know, <laughs> you, don't one to, time, you don't have I'm, to apologize. You don't sorry, even... guys. From now on, it's all upbeat. Up no, no, no. <laughs> you, you, you have nothing to apologize for. But like this question of like uh, an episode being a filler episode, that that was the complaint that like nothing happened, quote unquote, in that episode. But like for for. A, a, you know, whatever your critique of that episode might be, what they w needed to do and what they were trying to do in that episode is form a bond between these two Lokis in a way that, like, we find out in this episode is is not even, like, a platonic camaraderie, but, like, a bona fide romantic spark between these two that seems like it's going to be plot significant when they, like, if a mere forearm grays. Uh, can send a, a you know a nexus event shooting up <laughs> off the sacred timeline. What could anything else do? Do you know what I mean between yeah. these two? So uh, that's what they were. You know, your mileage may vary about whether or not they were successful. They they successfully wrapped that emotional connection into a plot that worked for you. But I think it was important to take an episode just to build those emotions, yeah. so that when mobius lies to loki and says she's dead like t and tom hiddleston has this reaction that feels you know earned uh in that moment you exactly know? i i think the opening of this most recent episode nothing happens they're sitting there waiting for their doom to, to strike and uh they're doomed to arrive their deaths to come and they're just sitting on rocks and i thought there was a lot of character development there um and that was really beautiful. And there definitely was some in the previous episode. I think maybe it was just the other stuff they had to dress it up. It's I, the parts. Those are the parts that I thought. Just I have to wonder, hmm. like, because because um, and I mentioned this to you last week because the episode ends so abruptly last week, and the runtime was a little shorter. I have to wonder if there was a cut of that episode that ends with those two doors appearing. And them standing up. That felt like... And then it cuts to them at the TVA. Like, that felt like the start of the next episode. Yeah, you know I agree. I mean? like, so the, like, the slow-mo yeah. perp walk as they're going through the hall felt... That felt like the way episode four probably was right. supposed to start. So I, I don't know why they... Sh I, like, I, I don't know. I don't know this for certain. But it seems like that's the case. And I don't know why they would have shifted that in there. Um, maybe, maybe they just wanted to keep it, like, just... Loki and Sylvie and not like involve the TVA or whatever, but um. Well, they could have. You could have ended it with just the doors opening because we don't the, even see them go through. Yeah, but you you have. I mean, like what we. Uh, yes, uh, that's uh, that's what I mean. Like I think it should have ended with the doors opening and with that moment, like because something you said you were missing in episode three was like Loki. Our Loki is giving her so much and she's giving him nothing, and I thought that was appropriate because you know she's. She has no reason to trust him. But then when she at the moment that she thinks she's going to die, then she opens up to him. And then we get that sort of yeah. bond. And I think that could have existed all in the same episode. I, I agree. Um, and I think I would have yeah. liked that more. You know, my my issue is not to relitigate it. It was just like some I think the action that they built into it didn't hold up for me and didn't interest me as much. And that's as far as it goes. Otherwise, I respect a lot of what the episode did and what it did accomplish. Uh, I didn't hate it, you know. 
I'm not, my TV. <laughs> you are not you are not on trial here at all. Like I um, shot okay. my television like Elvis Presley. <laughs> You're on not this show on ain't trial, good. Anthony. Um, uh, but like uh, you know, uh, just like oh, all right, you know, and and I think. Um, and I think you're right. There is a lot that paid off in in that those moments where, before the doors opened, and um, he, he he did have to, you know, he had to get his forty eight hours in with uh, with Lady Loki. You know, you have the two mismatched teammates who don't really like each other and don't trust each other, and they go through some ordeals, and then they do, and kind of prove each prove themselves to each other. So. Uh, I like the episode for that, and I feel like it did help support episode four in a really profound way. Um, what we get in that moment is we find out sort of, um, or what we get in this episode is we find out um, about young Sylvie coming into the TVA and, um, you know, under the care of Ravana um, in her, uh, her Minutemen days. And, um, and her fear, just this fear for this child sent through this whole process that we already saw. Like, it was funny when Loki went through it, right? And then we see this young girl, this young terrified girl go through it. And, like, her fear at the, like, robot detector and, like, all of that stuff is just, like, you know, obviously it casts the TVA in a really sinister light. But it it's showing us the origin of, uh, like, this great wound that's inflicted on her. She's ripped from her home at Asgard and um and put through all of this and I I thought that was really effective. What did you think? I thought it was really sad and it makes the TVA look horrible. You yeah. know, it looks they look cruel and especially later when she's like what was the thing that we did that what did I do that stepped outside of the bounds that made you decide to come erase me? And Ravona says I don't even remember. I don't do you think, I think she's, she's lying? lying? I think she's lying. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Ravonna lies a lot. Is what we find out. Yeah, that's um, true. <laughs> but uh, and I I read an interesting theory um, about that, and I'm so sorry I don't know the exact source on it, but I I read it from one of our listeners from another source because the, there is a big question of like what was the Nexus event for Sylvie because it wasn't her birth, it wasn't just being born a girl like that you know otherwise they would have zapped her as an infant right so something that happened when when she was young and someone came with a really good idea <laughs> that um you we see her playing with some toys um uh, before she's taken and there's like a viking ship a giant wolf um a dragon and a valkyrie and she's like depicting the valkyrie defeating the dragon um is what's happening and so someone's idea was like what if it's that in that moment she's making a choice to be like a heroic Loki rather than like a scheming Loki? Because the question that keeps coming up uh, when I talk to Kate, you'll hear Kate talk about this in our interview. And when I talked to Wunmi last week is this idea of like, if there is someone out there pruning timelines, do you have any control over whether you're n or not you're, a good person if someone is pruning all other opportunities for you to make the better choice if someone needs you to be the villain and i kind of feel like maybe that's what we're headed towards with loki it's like whoever's behind the tva and we'll talk about that in a bit like maybe they need loki to be the villain and maybe these various lokis like whoever boastful loki is he's worthy of a hammer you know what i mean like maybe these are the lokis who made better decisions and that's not the Loki that the sacred timeline wants or needs. Do you know what I mean? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. What did the reptile main... Loki do to <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. So maybe like young Sylvie, like she was, she was on the path to be a hero and the TVA is like, no, nope. we need, we need Loki to be our villain. And that's really heady stuff, right? You didn't even have a shot as a Loki to be a hero. You always had to be their villain. I'll be their monster, sort of thing. Um, we go from Sylvie's uh, later in the episode when when Loki gets stuck in this little looping time prison with a cameo from Jamie Alexander's Lady Sif. Um, we it's it feels like this is it's not just it's not that Loki's greatest fear or greatest punishment 
is being uh, cracked in the in the nethers by Jamie Alexander, though that couldn't have been pleasant. Uh, it's what she says, right? Which is, you'll always be alone. And so then we get to zero in on Loki's biggest fear is this isolation and loneliness. Well, like what, how did, how did, how did that land with you? Like, what do, what do you think the show's trying to tell us or trying to ask us to think about in terms of Loki here? Yeah. I, I, I go back to the Neil Young song uh, that I mentioned that maybe a couple episodes back, uh, he tried to do his best, but he could not. And I think this is about Loki um, who ultimately has to live with himself. And I, and I, really believe this in real life that you can't be a good friend you can't be a good partner to somebody else or a good parent unless you feel that you can live with yourself first right that you you feel that you're comfortable as yourself you don't have anything to give anyone else if you are um unless you have that steadiness right you know the, and, and in the nothing... words of uh, the prophet rupaul if you can't love yourself how the hell are you gonna love someone else go ahead yeah, yeah. that's right I, I, <laughs> I like that. that's a good quote from rupaul which is not to say that people who are unsteady or who have struggles or you know or unresolved uh difficulties are bad people it's just it's you're a person in need of help and uh and hopefully you have people who love you who will provide that help but those pe- that's what i mean is those people have to you know, if you're going to care for somebody who's who's ailing, let's say, or has a uh, just challenges of whatever sort, it it helps when um, when you just have that solidness about you. You know, and I think he's trying to find that. I think we get villainous Loki because he's insecure and he's angry and unstable. And what happens when he's not? He has something else to offer the world. And so I think that's kind of what we're seeing. This whole notion of you're alone, I think he's going to find that being alone is actually the thing he needs most of all. It may be what he fears most of all, but it's what he needs. And you and I have talked endlessly about how Marvel creates affection for its characters through um, through, through the people they love and care about, you know? And I think <laughs> it's ironic to say, but, you know, because there's such a, you know, narcissism is like, one of the badges that Loki wears on his sleeve, but I think loving who he is and yeah. feeling like he's a good person or feel a good demigod or feeling like he has something to contribute rather than just something to destroy um, is an important aspect of who he is. And I think once he achieves that, I think that's why you see that. Maybe that's why you see that variant thread, um, that Nexus event spiking so heavily. It's not, necessarily the touch or the romantic touch between the Lokis, but the notion that they're offering each other support. Yeah. They're being good guys. Well, I, th- I think it's both. <laughs> I, th- I think it's both. I sure. think because like um, Marvel.com had a piece that went up today with like Waldron and Kate Heron and Tom and et cetera, talking about this, like this absolutely is a romance that the, that like Michael Waldron, his initial pitch was like a Loki falls in love with another Loki. Like, and he sort of implied that that might be coming. He like he said in his 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 big interview that he gave us for the website, like that he just wants to be Nora Ephron. That's what he wants to be. Like this is a romance. And like what's funny is you'll hear. I talked to Kate Heron for this podcast last Friday. I asked about the romance. She kind of said no. Um. So that's gonna maybe flavor how you interpret maybe anything else that Kate says to me <laughs> because. You know they're trying to protect their plot turns or whatever. I think there may be a what might have been a way for her to answer that question without it being quite so uh, untrue. But but uh, but I know that that they're sort of they got their hands tied on some things. So um, but I so it's a, it's definitely a romance. Like and and this idea. Ooh, like what I love about this idea is you know Mobius says something about like whatever it is you guys did. Like I think it could bring this whole place down. Right. Like. And you don't have a line like that if that's, you know, not going to be something that probably happens. Like, yeah, yeah, if, if, that's like a, foreshadowing if, for sure. If a, if a kiss takes down the TVA or whatever. But like you, you have to go back to what Loki said in episode three, where he said love is a dagger. Like if mm. their love for each other and you can, you know, call it whatever you want there. But that bond 
is their greatest weapon. Love is a dagger. Love is a weapon. Love is a weapon that will protect us. Mm -hmm. Love is a weapon that will take down this thing that wants us to be villains when really we we don't that's not who we want to be you know we could be heroes <laughs> <laughs> just for one day you know? yeah so so, so yeah. all right can we so, take it into the re into real world sort of, of could course. you fall in love with a variant of yourself i uh like some people are like i would like to be with another me like somebody you know not exactly you not a clone of you but like i don't know i mean like so some people like to be with someone who's very different from them and challenges them and for some people, it, it feels better to be with someone who, who thinks the way that you do so that you don't feel like you have to explain yourself constantly. Do you know? And so I, I like this idea that Loki, our Loki, because we've been with him longer, is finally met someone who's not going to judge him for who he is. Like, we talked about similar things with Mobius. And Moby's like, I know you're smart. You know what I mean? Like, this Loki, he doesn't have to prove him his worthiness, which is what he was, I mean, like, Odin is one of the crappiest dads in all the MCU, right? If not the crappiest. And like Loki having to constantly prove worthiness, this whole worthy crap that is running around Asgard. Like that is what has twisted him up. And so this this meeting this woman who like he doesn't have to prove his worthiness to, you know, her. Like she knows who he is. She knows even like his worst impulses. And he doesn't have to hide it or explain it or anything like that i think there is something really attractive in that do i want it personally i don't know <laughs> but like yeah, I, I, what right? what do you think what do you think i don't think so i like my wife and i've been together a long time and i yeah. think uh the best my the best thing is that she's very different for me and i feel like she opens up the world to me in a lot of ways that uh i might not see or not might not understand so i like some i think i would uh I would file for divorce instantly for myself. <laughs> Wouldn't last. It would be like one of those Hollywood uh, tabloid marriages that ends before uh, it even the honeymoon's over. No, I, I, I don't think I could go for a variant. I'd be interested to have meet a variant, but I don't know that I... I don't think we would get along too well. <laughs> um, the one thing I will say that I am not a big fan of is the way that episode two ends with this like bombing of the timeline and it's this big deal and when we cut to like the timeline's fine now <laughs> like they fixed it off screen somewhere and that's like that's a little uh it feels a little sloppy to me to make such a big deal about her d bombing the timeline across time and space and then it's just yada 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 fixed i guess off screen do you know what i mean like yeah yeah i mean yeah you know uh, I agree. So uh, don't hate me, folks. <laughs> I think there's a couple of examples here where the big drama doesn't actually manifest as much. Uh, so I think that's a little bit of a problem. Yeah, we got a couple emails about it. Uh, people are like, what, you know, what happened with the whole bombing of the timeline? And I'm like, yeah, it's, I mean, maybe it'll come back. But and I understand that it was more of a diversion than anything else. But like, we still saw it was like an all hands event at the TVA and then everything is just reset back to normal, you know? So um, let us talk about the, the awakening that we see uh, for B-15 and for Mobius. Uh, B-15 a little bit more um, direct, uh, Mobius a little bit more theoretical. But um, this, is, this is another place in which I'm like a little unsatisfied with the way that this played out in this episode, uh, B-15, B-15 gave me a little like tears in the rain vibe, right? Cause they're standing in the rain outside the rock totally, garden and like, yeah. is she crying? We can't know because it's tears in the rain. Who knows? Blade Runner. But, um, but I, I mean, when Mima Sok is so good and her performance is so good, but I think I wanted to like, I wanted that moment to feel even bigger than it did. What did you think? <sighs> okay. Well, we have found a little bit of variance between us then because I really loved that moment. And mm -hmm. I did definitely, I definitely had Blade Runner vibes coming off of it. But um, what I, what I love was we don't see what she sees. And you're right that that might've made it bigger, but instead it all rested on Wunmi uh, Masaku saying, 
I was happy. And she says it in such a sad way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, like, and she's such a tough character, B-15. Like, she's all armored up. And she looks really strong. It looks like she could throw you through a room. Like, she's she looks like nobody you'd ever want to mess with. She seems so vulnerable. Like, I just wanted to embrace her and comfort her. And, and it wasn't that she was sad it was she was sad because she saw that she had been happy she'd had a, a good life that was ended and taken away from her by the tba so um i just outstanding performance by when me there uh so no, I, I, she's I, fantastic i think yeah i think and i know I mean, you were not talking about her but just sort of story-wise but i i i like to i think we're going to learn more about her and i was content once i just heard heard her description it remind you know what it reminded me of is have you ever seen those videos of young kids who get the cochlear ear implant and it's like okay we're gonna turn it on and their eyes get really big and they hear their mother's voice for the first time and like like the, they're just kind of overjoyed and kind of mind blown by it like that's what it, it reminded me of. but you don't hear what they're hearing right it, you just are observing their reaction so it's sort of witnessing her awakening just externally by looking at her and seeing how she how she like, sort of uh, crumbled in a, in a lot of ways uh, was really moving, I thought. How do you feel about Mobius not getting like a similar moment that is just sort of like... I think it's coming. Working the case, but not... Okay. I, th I, I don't think he's dead. Do no, you, no, I, no, no, no. I definitely don't think he's dead. I just like he seems to know the truth without having that moment where like... He saw his life and all we got was like, maybe I had a jet ski. And I'm like, I don't, I'm, do I need to see Owen Wilson on a jet ski? I'd prefer to, but like, do I need to see that? No, but I feel like I needed a bigger moment for him because like he's processing it throughout this whole, like as he's stealing Ravana's time pad, like as he's doing all this sort of stuff, like he's processing it, but we're not, we don't get that. Like maybe I'm spoiled by Westworld where it's just yeah. like a big earth shattering moment every time one of those, like robots wakes up you know what i mean yeah i i would just draw a line between hunter b15 mobius and kid lady loki like what we're seeing in each of these instances is the cruelty of the tva Absolutely. you know and i think just allowing that to sit with the audience it's positioning us against this entity which we never really nobody loves a bureaucracy to begin with but it was it's kind of like, oh, yeah, I guess we understand law and order, right? You've got to keep keep the peace, keep the timeline together. And now you start to see, like, well, wait a minute. Maybe these people who are keeping order are actually not being very uh, fair about it. And maybe I mean... They're, maybe they're keeping <laughs> their own order, right? I think, I think we were appropriately skeptical, Um from the start on this podcast but i do i do think that like it's it's in the course of the show like the tva is is it's just like if you're if you're if you're looking at the propaganda on the walls i'm not i'm not trusting those no. people from the start um but i think it's it it is good for for the show to go on that journey for these characters it yeah. makes you feel it i mean we kind of yeah. intuited that they were yeah. up to no good but it, it makes you feel it human uh we got a we got a question from Rebecca who asked, "How did Young Lady Loki know how to use that gadget to escape from the TVA when she'd been taken?" Um, I think you know, just sleight of hand. Like it's the same thing that Loki's been doing. She just lifted it off Ravana and yeah. ran with it. So, and how did she know how to use it? It's pretty. Uh... It's yeah. pretty lo-fi. When you looked at it, it looks like an old-school Game Boy. Yeah, the, the UI is really easy. Yeah, it's like eight bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so um, uh, I think it's pretty simple. Yeah, but I like the fact, like thinking about Sylvie on the run since she was that little, um, being alone and scared, you know, and 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 that goes back to what Mobius said about Loki. I just think of you that scared little boy, that scared little baby boy. Like, you know what I mean? These they're they're the same, and they found each other. I think it's really beautiful. Um, all right, let us go to sort of this uh, up the elevator moment. Um. We got a Wizard of Oz moment. We got, we got some Last Jedi throne room fight stuff happening. I totally thought of Last Jedi, too. I'm glad you mentioned it because I was like, what? Am I picking this up? Yeah. No, definitely. Um, how do you feel about the fact that we like met the met the space lizards and then immediately they were revealed as, as robots? 
I feel really good about that because I, um, I, I think this episode, it, it does a good job of, uh, matching what you and I have been proposing on here. Uh, sometimes, <laughs> you know, like, uh, I don't like when we're disproved. And so, uh, it's always better when we're right about everything, but you know, I think it, it, this shows the people that the, that we don't know everything in advance. We don't get, uh, we don't get clued in and we're not talking, you know, ahead of ourselves. Uh, but I, I believe that we're going to see Kang the Conqueror and Jonathan Majors as that character. And so when he wasn't the center figure of that tri- triumvirate, uh, I was like, oh, damn. Oh, no. I thought, that's, <laughs> I thought all those carvings looked like him. Yeah. And then when the, and I was like, I guess I was wrong about that, you know? Uh, but then when uh, they decapitated and it's great moments with Abe Lincoln, <laughs> like, um, you know, it's like a, you know, Imagineering animatronic. I was like, okay, this is weird. Like, why do this? Like, why create this Chuck E. Cheese band for everybody to stand before? But, uh, you know, there's got to be a good reason for that, for these guys to stay in the shadows. And um, I think we'll, I'm, I'm eager to learn more about that. So I felt pretty good about it, just from a we were right standpoint. And I also felt pretty good about him saying, you know, maybe I, where I'm from, I had a jet ski. Because I'm like, you're from the 90s, man. I'm uh-huh. going to find that out for sure. Yeah. Um, the The idea at this point that, like, and this is something that, yeah, Anthony and I have been talking about in in the sort of more advanced section of the podcast, this idea that, like, perhaps the person behind all of this is a character called King the Conqueror, uh, who is this uh, big villain uh, in Marvel Comics and who uh, will be played by the actor Jonathan Majors in the upcoming Ant-Man film. And uh, so that's been the a, a popular theory and then, like, last week at some point, I was like, maybe it's a Loki behind the TVA, but I think we're swinging real hard back to Kang. Uh, how much we see him or whether or not we actually physically see him will be a question. But a reason that folks have been expecting Kang the Conqueror might be coming from the start um, is that the character of Ravonna Renslayer is uh, his wife <laughs> in the comics. Uh, and it's it's another reason why people have been a, a little uh, wary of Ravonna. Um, because of her Kang associations in the comics. So, I mean, I think this, this episode bears out that she is, uh, if not fully in the know of what's going on, at least complicit, uh, in what's going on. So here we go. We're yeah. off to the races. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I just, I, I think that, uh, Joy wrote and asked what happened to B-15 and, mm. um, uh, the, uh, <laughs> The what happens is she comes in and she just gets knocked out. Uh, she's not mm-hmm. she's not dead. She's not pruned. She's like sort of knocked out, down for the count, for a minute. Uh, so uh, we'll see uh, if she pops up to help. Yeah, Sylvie. she's gonna be back too, right? Yeah, she's yeah, back. yeah. All right. Is there anything else you want to talk about in this sort of like first section here before we move on? I thought this was a pretty strong episode, and uh, it's uh, it's one that had a lot of. Joanne Robinson favorited uh, talking, you know, there wasn't, <laughs> apart from the, the Last Jedi battle, there was, it was kind of light on action, so I, I, I really enjoyed the, uh, you know, the interpersonal aspects of it. I, I thought, I love the scenes between Ravona and Mobius, too, where he realizes she's lying to him, mm-hmm. you know, and how she keeps saying, oh, how strange you're behaving, you're being so odd. He's being actually reasonable for the first time. And uh, I thought all of that was really cool. So I, was, uh, I was moved by this episode. I was excited by it. I love the weird mysteries that it conjures, both with the post credit scene and the animatronic timekeepers. Like, why do that? Uh, I thought the performances were all great. So I'm eager for episode five. Um, all right, so let's go to our interview with Kate Heron. Like I said, uh, Kate was sort of giving me some editorialized answers because she couldn't uh, she couldn't talk freely. But so so bear that in mind when you hear her answers. Like, given the answer she gave me about the Loki Sylvie romance, that makes me question the answer she gave me about Miss Minutes, which is something we could talk about in the in the post interview section. 
um, because uh, th that is someone that people have their eye on. So let us go now to our interview with Kate Heron. It's 2021. A lot of us spent <laughs> the last year in our house, maybe not wearing shoes at all. So guess what we don't have time for as we as we work our way back into the world? Uncomfortable shoes. That's where Rothy's comes in. Rothy surveyed thousands of customers and the number one word used to describe their shoes is comfy. What makes Rothy's so good? Their unique seamless design is insanely comfortable the moment you put them on. Their styles are sustainably made with materials like plastic water bottles. They're fully machine washable. It's wild and available in tons of shapes, styles and colors. So you can always find the right one for you. I, I have like four pairs of Rothy's at this point. They're basically the only shoes that I wear. I love them. They come in these bright, beautiful colors that I really like. And there's also some more muted styles. You can just get like a simple black flat, perfect, versatile, works with everything. It's a brand that really lives up to the hype. Who Would Wear says that celebrities are far from immune from the draw of Rothy's wildly popular shoes. Pop Sugar named Rothy's one of the most comfortable and cute flats you'll never tire of wearing. Who better to tell you about how comfortable Rothy's shoes are than the real customers, though? Lisa L says, these shoes are like walking on clouds. And Julie A says, there's no break in period, no blisters, just pure comfort. No wonder Rothy's best-selling shoe, The Point in Black, has over 5,000 near-perfect reviews. Upgrade your closet with washable, sustainable, stylish shoes and bags from Rothy's. Plus, they just launched men's shoes, so make sure to check them out for you or the guy in your life. Head to rothys.com slash watching to find your favorites today. That's R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash watching. Get comfy. This episode is brought to you by Athena Health, creator of innovative electronic medical record, revenue cycle, patient engagement, care coordination, and population health services for medical practices and health systems. Some healthcare IT companies have just begun to move toward connected systems. Athena Health started there. See how their unparalleled nationwide network of providers enables the insights that drive better clinical and financial outcomes. Learn more at athenahealth.com. Hello, hello. So, so good to see you. So good to talk to you. Um, I wanted to start by asking you, um, how does it feel to finally sleep and be a, a sane person in the world again? Yeah, it's weird because I'm, as I said, I'm back in my childhood bedroom. <laughs> from... Yeah. So no, but yeah, it's really nice to see my family again. Um, it's so nice to just be back in England. Yeah. And just get, yeah, like you said, get some sleep because it's been nonstop for the last two years, pretty much with Loki. So um, no, but I, I, what I really wanted to start by asking you was about, um, about Sophia, because um, I know that she is someone that you had worked with before. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was wondering, you know, what made her the person you want to slide into this role here? So Sophia is someone that I just think is a really fantastic actor. You know, like I've, uh, I'd worked with her before in my short film Smear, and she'd also uh, played a, a head for me <laughs> in a horror pitch I was doing. Um, so, yeah, we definitely knew each other and through comedy and filmmaking circles. And she just has this like, fire and vulnerability but she's also really funny and it's just it felt like so many different components about what I love about her as an actor are very Loki like so I was like I just when we were auditioning people I was like you know let's just get her on tape because I just think she's really interesting and I thought she was amazing in Flowers and yeah so no I, I was really excited just to get her in and just kind of see her take on the character so what did you um I know that that Michael called this sort of like the before sunrise episode but like what did you think of in terms of the dynamic between these two and, and what you wanted to capture I was really inspired by Bisha's script because I, I remember that Bisha she had like children and men as a reference and before sunrise and I was like that's such an interesting combination to me you know to have these there's such different references and I loved it because it was like a character driven story you know, and you can kind of see it in the way we filmed it, right? We've got these very long kind of two shots. So it has this kind of walking quality to it, like Before Sunrise. And you feel like you're with them. But at the same time, it's in this children of men, like, you know, apocalyptic uh, situation that they're in. So I, I think for me, what I was inspired by from those references was, you know, like, for example, like Pompeii in episode two, like Loki is joyous. And we see that situation completely through his POV. Mm -hmm. And obviously Pompeii, I imagine if you were there was not joyous it was right. probably very it was very scary and 
I think it was important. Like we we sort of start to tip it a little bit with Rock's car in that, you know, it's like these apocalypses are scary situations and this is real people here. You know, that when they go into the the kind of the, the storeroom where the people are sheltering from the storm. And I think for me with this one, I was like, okay, well, I, I was really inspired by how Bisha had captured this kind of class society within the moon and just kind of giving that a reality really. And and I think for me, that was exciting. And also seeing this kind of apocalyptic scenario through our two characters eyes, which obviously is very interesting because when they go to the train station, they are, you know, <laughs> they're aware of what they're doing is terrible, but they're like, okay, well, we'll get on this train. But I think that's why it was so important by the time they reached Sheru, the city, that it, it is quite horrible and it is quite scary. So yeah, those were definitely like touchstones for me for sure. What about like the specific dynamic between these two? Like, okay, let me let me put it this way. Am I supposed to be uh shipping Loki with Loki? How am I supposed to be feeling about this, Kate? Is this am I watching a I, romance? What am I watching? <laughs> I think honestly, I think the thing I'd say that we want to steer people in is more just that it, what would happen if you met someone who was a version of you but wasn't necessarily you because you know she isn't the Loki we've seen. <laughs> She's a completely unique character. And I, I think that was really important was just that, you know, that she was like, there's things about her which would be familiar to us through having seen them through Tom's Loki. Mm -hmm. But then there are things about her that are completely different because her world experience is very different. I mean, I can even put that down to like their fighting styles, right? Like the way she fights is very rough and very ready, which we kind of, um, I wouldn't really say we explore why her fighting's that way, but we kind of explore more her background and why she is, you know, why she, why she, why she would fight like that. Whereas Loki grew up in a palace. So, you know, he's very balletic the way he moves. Right. So yeah, right. no, I would say more, it's the idea of, I think identity it always comes back to identity for me. It's kind of like what would happen if you met this version of yourself, because I think we can sort of learn so much from ourselves. <laughs> to that end, you know, these are, these are two Lokis as far as we know, like looking at each other, but what, what are we to make of Sylvie's, deep aversion to the name Loki like what what can you tell us about that at this point her identity is something we definitely delve into as the show goes on in terms of like you know like why is her hair blonde and why is she pushing away this view of you know who she was so I think for me like I don't want to spoil anything but I, I would just say that yeah like she's definitely a very different version of the character and someone like our Loki, I guess, in a sense, that's kind of working out who they are. So I think that's what was so exciting to me with Sylvie is that, you know, this is a character that we find out in episode two is hiding in apocalypses. And the question is why? And yeah, what what is her motive? Like what what drives her? And I think the thing I liked so much about Ep3 was them kind of sharing those bits of knowledge between them. And I think you get the sense, even when at the end he says, I know so much, you know, you've, I told you so much about myself and I know not very much about you. And she's like, yeah, thanks. But I think that for me is so intriguing because it's like, yeah, what, what does she have to share with him and what was her journey and what kind of Loki is she? So. Right. The, the, the line in this, in episode three, what, what makes a Loki a Loki? That's like mm -hmm. the thesis statement of the show, right? Like what, when yeah. you take away these other influences, what is at the core of a Loki? Well, I had in my pitch on a slide, I remember I put that <laughs> as like one of the, because I was like so excited by that, like intellectually. And yeah, and I think that's definitely something that me and the writers and like, yeah, the whole team is like, that's that's really like the central beating heart of the show is, yeah, what does make a Loki a Loki? And we kind of break that down. Would you feel like we will know definitively by the end of six episodes what makes a Loki a Loki or uh to be continued I think we I, I think we definitely bring it to a point where I feel the story is satisfying in the sense that yeah I think we do I don't I think it's tricky always right to always answer like what makes a person or, or a god in the sense of our story <laughs> because you know people um it's funny saying people characters are ever evolving you know what I mean? So like we definitely, Hopefully, yeah. you know, our Loki <laughs> definitely goes on like an amazing journey, I'd say, across this story. And I think there's a lot of, you know, self-reflection. And <laughs> I think he, he will arrive to some answer to that question. But I, I don't really think it's ever a question you get an answer to, right? It's something you're always kind of working out. Yeah, 
Right. Hopefully, if you're if you're a curious person, you are continually <laughs> changing and evolving. Yeah. <laughs> I want to talk to you a little bit about Owen. Then, like, uh, you know, this yeah. hard pitch that you gave to Owen to sort of be <laughs> on this show. Um, something that I thought was interesting. Um, is this uh, you know, it was pointed out to me in interviews that one of the lines that really stood out for me in episode one, where he said like, "I can play the heavy keys too," is something that like Owen plucked from something Tom said to him about how you know loki is so i'm wondering like how how collaborative or involved was owen in crafting mobius's dialogue as as a writer Mm. himself like completely like i mean on set it's like you know we have these great scripts Mm. but you know the guys would improvise stuff within i think the thing with owen is it's it's almost like improv right like he he works out the rules of a scene (laughs) and he'll he'll do the written words but then sometimes he'll just you know sprinkle in other bits and pieces or give a line a twist in his his way of speaking so like for example um in the archives when they're talking about candy i think that scene originally ended being like on like boom kablooey and like but then owen was like you don't have candy on asgard and then tom was just like great it's not <laughs> and he was like oh, no wonder you're so bitter but they they improvised that whole bit and i think for me that was really fun i mean i'm always as a director i'm very actor driven so i'm and i guess because my background's in comedy so I, i'm always going to be like you know obviously honoring what we've worked on with the writers but at the same time like i think that's the joy right with filming is that you know it's always evolving it's always changing you know you you go out with your script and you but when you get to set some things just change with the script whether that be you know an act of god like rain or an actor being like oh could i maybe twist the line in this way and then you get to the edit and it's almost like not like you begin again but it's again just always evolving and changing because you know you're working out okay this is the next part of now telling this story so yeah but Owen was great like he's he's a genius and yeah and he does have a writer's brain for sure so he wasn't obviously like physically writing lines but in the sense that yeah he was definitely like improvising and throwing things in left right and center but always within I'd say like keeping respect to the character and yeah there's just there's lots of fun Owenisms across it but yeah but with the heavy keys Tom has a way of describing Loki, which I love, which is um, he describes his personality as different keys on the piano. And when me and him were talking about the show, we would be like, oh, okay, well, maybe now we'll get to see some other keys on the piano, which is quite exciting. And I think something that Owen really loved about that, obviously, I think they, they kind of obviously spoke about Loki because he's meant to be a Loki expert. And he definitely took in that analogy. And yeah, and that's how it ended up in the show. But the other day, I remember Owen, I was talking to him on the phone and he was like, you kept in a lot of the, a lot of the improv. And I was like, yeah, it's great. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. I think there are plenty of, of directors or editors who might, you know, snip around that and keep Hugh closer to the script. And so I, I like that you're like, no, we're going to keep, we're going to keep, we're going <laughs> to sprinkle those Owenisms all the way through if we can. That's so fun. What, I mean, obviously we learned something huge in episode three that sort of, you know, has to realign the way that we think about Owen's character, Wunmi's character, Sasha's character, et cetera. This idea that they are like variants with their, with their minds wiped um, or something. Um, you know, what, what should, what, what can you say about what we should be thinking about around that revelation? I would say that we will, more will come in answers. <laughs> Everyone's like, sure. damn you. Um, but I, uh, but honestly, I think again, it just comes back to the idea that everybody is not one thing in this show. It's always about like, and, and I feel for me, that's so Loki. I feel like his DNA is across everything in the sense that, you know, Loki isn't completely good or bad. He's a bit more gray area. And I think that also falls into, that echoes across all our characters you know what I mean? And I, and I think that's very interesting to me, the idea of good versus evil. And yeah. And what does that mean for the TVA? What does that mean for the workers? If they don't know, you know, their true past. And I, it's obviously something we'll talk about. But yeah, but I would say more of this, it kind of plays into those themes. And that's probably all I can say <laughs> without sure, sure. ruining anything. But Sure. Yeah. But I mean, I, at the very least, it has to, uh, you know, if we weren't already perturbed by the propaganda posters mm-hmm. or, you know, the fascistic uh, uniforms of the TVA, this wrinkle is very sinister feeling. Like, it's meant to feel sinister, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, that's safe. That's safe. <laughs> we're not spoiling anything. Um. Okay. Uh, so... <laughs> Let me let me ask you uh, this question. Okay, so yeah, so you brought up good versus evil. Um, I want to talk to you about something that like Woonmi talked to me about last week was she was really interested in talking about this, these themes of good versus evil um, 
on a very religious sort of sense of good versus evil. And obviously mm -hmm. like you've introduced um, this theological language when it comes to like sacred timeline, we're dealing, you know, Loki was comparing the TVA to like the gods of Asgard, all this sort of mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, I was wondering, you know, sort of how intentional were some of, I, like, I got a little too, I'll, I'll say this, I got a little too inside my head about this episode three. And I was like, oh my God, they're at the gates, the, the pearly gates, and they get dropped down into like a hellscape. And then someone calls them devils. Like, is that, how intentional is all of that? How are you thinking about this as like, um, you know, how biblical should we be thinking here? I think it's definitely something that me and the writers were interested in. I mean, it's even like in episode one, right? Which, you know, Michael, uh, like the first episode, like the, the, the devil in the window. I mean, for me, like I, I thought, you know, on one level that's interesting because, you know, Loki has horns and it's connected to Loki in that way. But I loved it because I was like, yeah, he is like, you know, in a way like the devil, like he fell from heaven was, and was cast out. And I think there's definitely we have imagery across it. And, you know, we were so I, it's definitely something that I was interested in in terms of, you know, like their discussion in the cafeteria, like talking. I mean, I love that scene because to me, it feels so relatable. It's like two people, completely different religious backgrounds, but it's not like they're going at each other and being hateful towards each other. They're just kind of being like yeah, like, this is what I believe. <laughs> I know it sounds weird, but this is what I believe. And that felt very relatable to me, just, you know, in seeing people kind of discuss that. So I think, yeah, there's definitely imagery of that running across it. Um, yeah, I would say, yeah, there is definitely. I know, I know you talked about Seven as an mm -hmm. influence, and I loved, like, I think my favorite game that, <laughs> we're talking about it as a game, but my favorite game that I played in this season is you said there's a there's a seven easter egg in episode two you said that in an interview and then i was like oh i'm gonna find it and then i found the music cue and i was like so proud of myself uh that i found it but like um i think in that interview you said that there was like you know bigger sort of seven inspiration for you like how how big is the because seven is also a um a story that's very occupied with this idea of good versus evil, biblical, mm. good, biblical, evil. Like how, how much should we be sort of thinking, having that in mind as we're watching this? Hmm. I would say like, I mean, you summarized it so nicely, but I, I would say definitely like the idea of good versus evil. Are we completely good or are we completely bad? Can we move past, you know, terrible past actions? I mean, this, this falls into our Loki already, you know, we, wasn't so long ago he was in new york so <laughs> right 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 but it, but it yeah. is like a ripple effect across everything in our story and i think it is something where we want to definitely challenge the audience in some ways to you know question that within the characters themselves it's like kind of what you said it's like oh but how do i feel about this character now i have this information so i i, I think that it's definitely a, a ripple effect across the whole show i would say yeah. though honestly the biggest reference for me was seven um, but definitely thematically, of course, that falls into it, um, was really stylistically in terms of like me and my DP, because basically when I pitched on the show, I had like an outline of it and I had the first two scripts and I loved in the second script, I felt like almost the first script for me felt like a prologue and the, se and the second script for me almost then was like, okay, now this is the first chapter of the book, you know, where Loki goes. And I loved that it was like a mystery and it was like a detective story. And I remember I was saying to them, oh, we should make this like film noir. Like that would be so cool to me. And also because I was dealing with half in my head, I was like, okay, well, the TVA is outside of time and space. There's no sun. <laughs> There's no sun. Like, how do I show this place? And obviously I went to the comics and took a lot of inspiration from there visually as well. And then worked with my production designer in Autumn, obviously. But I think something me and Autumn really connected on is that, yeah, we 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 love like the same lighting. And I and I think because also the the variant was always attacking from shadow right and for me I was like oh that's such like a detective story so yeah so there's seven but l loads of obviously loads of film noir and like that loads right. of stuff we were pulling from but yeah. yeah but that was definitely one that we just kept coming back to and then obviously when you've got a character in a library like re I was like oh well we have to like do an homage to that scene I, I think because honestly I just love Fincher I think he's a genius and yeah and I was like okay well Maybe he won't mind <laughs> me doing a little nod to his uh, his story. I had a listener point that out to me that the credits were very seven as well. Yeah, yeah. I think because basically we also had like um, Kazza and his team. We just had so much beautiful stuff that we couldn't all get into the show. And like even like um, and, and I was and it felt like, OK. And also because we we're building this whole new corner of the MCU, right, with the TVA. 
And it felt again like, okay, well, the credits are another chance for us to do some fun world building and kind of just, you know, show more of this beautiful tech that, you know, our team had made. So yeah, and and definitely Seven. And I I think it was just fun for us to kind of lean into that a little bit. And um, yeah, and just again, show off. And like, there's pictures that change each time we do the credits. I'm sure people have noticed that. And yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) yeah, but it was just, it was just really fun, I think, in that sense. And just the kind of, like the style like even like the way because I, I think because the the rolling loki t- title had been established before i joined but we shifted it slightly to that more black and white color and that kind of effect because for me anyway i was like again i think it was really just the film noir influence i just uh yeah i just was like oh i think that really like gives it you know the sense of identity that we're going for here but also keeps the interesting thematic idea of you know loki's always changing he's not one thing in the sense of the letters moving so one more thing about this sort of religious good versus evil thing. Something sure. that when we said that I thought was so interesting is she said, um, can we even be held accountable for our actions if there is some sort of hand guiding the timeline or something like that? Then what, and, and we haven't been able to make these choices for ourselves. How can we then be called good or evil if someone else is sort of guiding those choices for us? Um, and I was wondering like what, what you can say about that. Hmm. It's definitely an interesting discussion, isn't it? Because I think Loki within himself, right? People always talk about his actions within Avengers and they're like, oh, but, you know, he was under the influence. So like, but I I think I'd say, hmm, that's interesting. And just thinking of a good answer. (laughs) (laughs) I guess that plays into it, right? Is like, if someone does something that's greatly evil, it's like, to what end? And if someone does great evil, right? Like, I guess if someone was completely without empathy, that it's almost like a way to remove yourself from the situation right which i don't i think all our characters have a lot of you know they might not always make the best choices but you know in our loki for example tom's loki we see there's empathy there there's regret there even when he talks at the end of the first episode he's like i did it because i had to so i think for me yeah i mean there has to be some element of choice in that right like but obviously the overarching plan is that yeah like loki like he was meant to be arrested but he didn't do that. So that took him off his path. I guess the question will come more down to like, how big does the action have to be to take you off your path? But anyway, I'm going off on a tangent now. Right. No, I mean, that's an interesting thing because like, obviously if variants exist, there have to be some paths that are woven back into the sacred timeline. You know what I mean? It's not like, yeah. it's not like every branch is pruned. Some branches are sort of have such minimal Managed. growth. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. That helps clarify something for me. Okay. So you mentioned, you mentioned the big like research aspect of episode two. And so I know you're a Buffy fan, you know, I'm a Buffy mm-hmm. fan. So of course that makes me think of like so many Buffy episodes are spent like pouring over books with engravings and all that sort of stuff. Um, how influential is Buffy Vampire Slayer across your work here? Like in what way are you thinking about that show? That's so interesting. Do you know what? I think I wasn't consciously thinking about it, but I saw it when I was like so young and it's definitely a show where like, you know, I suppose like our show, like it's weekly and, you know, I, it would always keep me coming back to want to watch the next week. I liked all the characters. And again, like some of the characters in that are very like morally like Faith. I love Faith, but is she a good guy or a bad guy? That definitely jumps between both of those places. And yeah. And I think for me, yeah, there's definitely crossover, I would say, but it was never, it wasn't sort of a reference. I suppose it's a funny thing, right, as a filmmaker, like I definitely have some references that obviously people can just see on the surface when they watch this show, like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or Brazil or Blade Runner, where it's like, there must be some that from a film I saw or a TV show I watched a very long time ago, you know, that I may not even consciously Right. be aware of I mean I saw like I, I read your easter egg document and you were talking about lost in the first bit and like I'm a massive fan of it and so is Michael but I was like maybe subconsciously somewhere that was a reference I mean I was referencing Iron Man with that scene right. but yeah but 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 I was like but it might have played into it though do you know what I mean because we just I love that show so I know no, that's... I would say probably Buffy is somewhere in the DNA of the show <laughs> just because I I love it so a bunch yeah. of people were asking if uh, the Randy character in episode two was a Buffy reference, um, <laughs> a reference to Tabula Rasa and Randy Giles. And I was like, well, maybe, I don't know. But um, I don't know. Because yeah. yeah, his character name was written in by Alyssa, the writer. So yeah. he would be the person I would say uh, readers <laughs> to ask that question. Um, yeah. yeah. So it might have been intentional. 
from her. But that's the, I mean, that's the thing about an Easter egg hunt. And you don't want to get like too bogged down in like what mm-hmm. Easter eggs are there, what references are there. Uh, thematically is more interesting to me, like the what you're talking about, Seven and stuff like that. Like the music cue is interesting, but then thematically that's that's even more interesting to me. And yeah, when you do an Easter egg hunt, obviously sometimes you pick up the wrong thing. I saw your Iron Man post. I was like, yeah, no, that's a better reference. Of course, no, of course, but- is that, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I don't think it's wrong though, because like there's stuff that people pick up in the show, and you know some of it is intentional, some of it might not have been intentional. But I kind of just think like when you make anything, like it's yours, right? Like while you're cooking away in it and building it, and then once it's out in the world, I think it's like the audiences. So no, I'm always excited by different reads people have on it. I love that you thought it was like lost. I was like, that's so cool. (laughs) So no, I, I I'm genuinely just excited. I try not to. I'm trying to now each week maybe just give a little bit more like kind of, to be honest, the kind of thing you'd hear on a director's commentary, more like making of kind of stuff. But I try not to give too many Easter egg stuff away because I think for me as someone that loves hunting for them, I think it kind of gives away a bit of the fun, right? So, yeah, and I and I, I read stuff online that people theorize and think about it. And, I, I yeah, I think it's really cool. But um, yeah. Well, then, then let's talk about some of the making of stuff. Um, yeah. You know, one, one question one of my listeners had was like how um, – was any of this episode, episode three, shot in the volume um, that that Marvel and, and sort of Lucasfilm have been using, or was it shot differently? In my head, I was like, the bubble. Um, sorry. <laughs> like, my, my very stupid technical way of talking about it. No, we, we didn't use that. So actually, we filmed, uh, basically, we filmed most of it on the back lot of the studio, we filmed outside for lighting reasons because it was like, you know, autumn was like, oh, actually, I think it's better if we are outside for it because of the kind of palette of the sky we were going for and how we could control the light. Mm-hmm. Um, so, no, we, we filmed it. All, it was very old school. We, well, old school in a sense. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, we filmed it surrounded by lots of blue screen. But and then Kazra, my production designer, built certain aspects. So like um, the the mining town, for example, obviously that shack they go up to where they fix the light. We had that. And then he designed and built this whole like kind of amazing, like kind of ghost town that they walk through. But on the day, obviously what you're working with with the actors is you have almost like flags in this dirt and soil and a few practical elements that you can put foreground. Cause I think that always helps sell the reality. Um, uh, but yeah, but the actors are acting off a lot of flags. And then I obviously have the <laughs> amazing um, artwork from our team to be like, this is what you're actually going to be walking through. Um, we also storyboarded like, I think I did I did storyboards for like 99% of the show. Like the whole thing is nearly storyboarded, basically because I love storyboarding. <laughs> um, and, I, and I should say I worked with a storyboard artist called Martin Mercer. And then there was a few other people that worked on certain sequences across the show along with Martin. Um, so some of it's just practical, right? Like you have to storyboard, like, for example, Sheru, the big finale one. Like, yeah we, yeah, we basically we boarded that to a certain extent but really we ended up doing a previs on that which is a, basically if anyone doesn't know it's essentially like a almost like the sims <laughs> and it's like a run through with these like virtual sim versions of your actors and they use the set design to scale and actors obviously and and that's what you kind of use as a basis for working out some camera moves and then visual effects can use that to see okay well this is where the practical set ends and then we begin. So it's kind of a way for your whole team to kind of put all your brains together and be like, how do we execute this? But Sharu, no, like that, that was a massive set that Kazra built that whole, like all the buildings obviously stopped above a certain height, but that was real. <laughs> so the, yeah, no, we the, didn't film in the volume. I'd love to, I haven't filmed in that before. So <laughs> it'd be cool. The <laughs> production design was, is incredible on this show. Just so incredible. The design of the TVA and the design of this planet is just, amazing i love it it's not like anything we've seen in the mcu before and i think it, which is exactly your prompt right develop a new corner of the mcu that we've never seen before and uh exactly fulfilled um i want to talk to you about that one or obviously you you brought up children of men earlier and like um was that did did bishop put that in the script where she's like and then it ends on this <laughs> long one and then you're like oh great or how how did how did that come about yeah, so basically the one wasn't in the script, but the, I think the thing that was really key in Bish's writing that I thought was so fantastic is that when you are reading it, you really feel like you're with them. And I remember that she had this amazing description of the planet cracking 
and she had I don't want to get this wrong so I'm sorry Bisha if I misremember it but she had this description of like a whole city falling silent and I just was so taken by that and I was like oh man that's so cool but I think the real beautiful thing in her writing though is that you really felt you were worried about them and you really felt for them and I think from that I was really inspired and then me and Autumn took that and then turn that into you know the what we see on screen today so it was basically taking what we what we had in the script from Bisha and then adapting that to work within you know the set that we had from Kazra um but yeah but I think that for me I was just the one I came out of the writing honestly I just read what she'd written and was like oh this is so cool because like I said like you know at the train station it's fun they're coming up with a plan and they're trying to sneak on a train and it's kind of not Pompeii but your POVs with the Lokis and you're kind of like working out how do these two characters, like, are they going to trust each other? Are they not going to trust each other? So that's what I loved about Sharu was that it's the first time they're really working as a team well, but it's also in these horrific circumstances. And it's also the first time as an audience, I felt we had to be along with them for the ride because it not only gives you insight into Sylvie because she's been hiding in these apocalyptic situations, but also I think importantly, it shows, you know, it's horrific. This is a horrific scenario they're in and they're not the only characters being affected by this. Obviously, we've seen this kind of rising, you know, uprising by the people that work on the planet against the oppressive kind of, you know, I guess like almost like police right. force that, that are on the planet. So I, I think that it was really trying to take those elements and put people into the throes of a, a horrible apocalyptic situation. But yeah, and that's why I think for me, the one I felt right because I wanted to... <clears throat> obviously me and autumn <laughs> i'm sure people have noticed we love doing long takes uh, <laughs> but but i think for us both it was just like our north star of like wanting to honor fisher's awesome writing but also for me like i knew i wanted to get one in the story somewhere but i think it always has to be led by what's right for the story rather than just oh let's just do a one you right. know what i mean so so i think that that felt like just seeing what the intent was i was like okay this definitely feels like the right way to approach this sequence what can you tell me about the um, the Asgardian song that finds its way uh, into this episode? <laughs> the Asgardian song was a, a Michael pitch um, that came in, I think, later. And I was like, oh, so funny and so lovely. And I think it's nice. You know, it's a little win for Loki. He has a nice time on the train. He has a song. And I think we haven't seen Loki like this before. And I think that to me was really interesting and yeah, and and it was specially written for us. Like it isn't a song we adapted, and Tom learnt the the lyrics, obviously, in the language. And yeah, but I think it was just nice again to just see Loki having you know a nice time, in obviously a complete Loki fashion with the backdrop of a, an apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, yeah. Um, something that Wendy also said to me was that um, I was asking her about reshoots, like if you guys did a lot of reshoots because Marvel Marvel mm -hmm. builds in right like a window to do reshoots. Um, mm -hmm. and she said no and one of I, she said not a lot and she said one, one of the reasons she thought was because because of the COVID pause there was a lot of like reworking of scripts that was like able to happen refining yeah. and stuff like that so I was wondering like if you could talk about like sort of how much work was done to tweak or change or tighten or whatever and, and mm -hmm. the nature of it in that pause yeah sure so I think the thing was like coming into it like already before COVID, right? So Michael had done his writer's room and then I joined the project and we did, I guess you could call it like, I mean, like a mini room at best. It was like me, Michael, Eric and Alyssa and Kevin Wright, our executive from right. Marvel. And then again, we were kind of working with the scripts and that was really like, I guess things I was bringing in, but also just the practicality of like, this is awesome, but this is kind of how we could execute it. You know, like yeah. that is, is for an example. Um, so we did a lot of work on the scripts already up to the point of shooting. Um, but I would say really what The Gap gave us, which I think is so interesting, is that, you know, normally you don't always know completely what you obviously have an idea of what you're making, but you don't really know until you're in the edit. And I think the the good thing about so when we obviously couldn't film anymore, I was like, OK, well, I'm just going to cut everything we filmed <laughs> with my editors and try out lots of different because I didn't have a composer then either, like temp music and just really key in on the tone right. of the show and see like, you know, what's singing, what's not singing, what are cool little nuances that the actors are doing that maybe on the day we might not see, but, uh, you know, as you craft the, you know, character with their wonderful performance, the, you start to notice those right. things. So I think really like 
for us that was definitely helpful in the sense that we kind of got I got a handle on like where the story was going and then with Eric like our production writer like me him and Kevin like we would talk a lot about like you know just like oh let's try and push it this way or this way and I think something else that came out of it just because obviously it was COVID there were certain scenes for example that uh we couldn't have a load of a lot of background so like uh, one that could be non-spoilery would be um episode one when Loki goes through the TVA and it's the DMV style and that room originally with Miss Minutes there was a huge queue of people there and but obviously we we couldn't do that because it wasn't safe but then it actually I think ended up working out better for story because you know it's almost more ridiculous (laughs) he's going into a room with all these turnstiles and this huge queue and he's like this doesn't make any sense but I think in a way that kind of really played into the kind of you know fish out of water story that he's going through but also just our own frustrations I'm sure like going to ridiculous bureaucratic right. kind of situations or even just something simple like trying to go for an airport security system <laughs> so I think we tried to make obviously it all work for story and would keep within the tone but yeah we definitely worked a lot on different characters and I think that did play into the fact that yeah our additional was very minimal like we we kind of went in with a very targeted plan and that's also partly why because I I love storyboarding, but obviously I had to board all these scenes because I was making obviously our background look like much more people than the, than were there sometimes. And I was sort of using tricks that I did in my short films <laughs> where I, you know, couldn't get like a huge amount of people for a party scene, for example, but I would have, like, okay, well, I'll film it, I'll frame it like this and have them cross camera and, you know, they can, we can reuse or we'll find ways to make it feel busy and thriving still. So yeah, I think that was a really big thing for us. and. Like I said, I didn't. I, I was trying out this different music, but over the break, I was like, okay, well, let's get a composer on because that would be really helpful. And then obviously, the amazing Natalie Holt joins oh, okay. us, yeah. and yeah, and it was great because I think both of us were in love with the, the idea of theremin because I, I had like, um, it's actually in episode two, but there's a, there's a track by Clara Rockmore, um, which plays in yeah. Renslayer's office, and that was in like my playlist when I pitched, and I kind of always felt like, oh, I'd love to bring that in somehow, and it felt just write to me in terms of because I wanted it to be this big love letter to sci-fi but when Natalie pitched she also like we hadn't discussed it but she she also had this amazing theremin and I was like oh I was like she's the one <laughs> she also loves the theremin and I think her music just I, I don't know I always feel like the dream collaborator for me right is that they bring a uh, it becomes a character of its own right like so Kazra's sets are such a character across the yeah. whole show Autumn's lighting I mean she even talks about it like she thinks of lighting as a character and camera as a character. And I think it was the same for Natalie's music. Like she was sending me these like melancholic, but also like these kind of playful kind of like, you know, bits of music to play with. And it felt so low key. And I think for me, like having that music then to cut in with what we had from the show, it even just led to ideas. Like as I was, you know, storyboarding sequences, I would be sometimes listening to her music because I don't know, I'm quite musical. So I like, so I would like listen to the music and be like, Oh, cool. I could move the camera like this or do this. And yeah. So I think it was definitely amazing to have got her on during that time. And like I said, just everyone, we already had like a really good set of scripts and story, but I think it was just adapting it so we could film it in safe conditions. But then again, like with what we'd found through already, what we filmed, just how do we tell the best version of this story and how can we keep adapting and keep evolving it? I think honestly it was just trying to make best use of the time really. Cause yeah. 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 (laughs) Um, uh, (laughs) relatable content. I, um, that's so funny. Speaking of, speaking of like erroneous Easter egg hunts, I, I shazammed that theremin track and I was like, what is this? How has this been used? (laughs) But now I know it was it's a it's a Kate Heron special. It's a it's just a Kate. It's a Kate <laughs> Easter egg. Um, that's so funny. Uh, <laughs> I want to ask you, I don't know what you can say about this, but um, uh, Tara Strong in giving an interview, gave this interview to THR about Miss Minutes. And she's like, you know, keep your eye on her. There's a lot to come, blah, blah. <laughs> and um, and that's got people like really wound up and excited. So I'm just wondering, like, how much <laughs> like what how how. How much is that like a great actor just being like excited about their about their part? And how much how much should we really just be like zeroing in on Miss Minutes? Hmm. I would say honestly, just that I think Miss Minutes is a really fun character. Like I, I remember in the first episode, she originally came out of that TV monitor 
but I just think and I filmed it but it's just when I was editing I was like no it's too crazy because <laughs> like the whole we'd already made like the the TVA in itself is like there's a lot to like suspend your disbelief for and I think that's why I was like okay let's keep her in the monitor and we'll bring her out in episode two but I, I which felt better in the sense that you know she's this living cartoon which was really fun but yeah I, I would probably say I mean she's part of our main TVA cast you know what I mean like all our characters so like you know I think the exciting thing with her character really is just I, I I would say yeah there's more to explore with her like all the characters at the TVA because as people hear in episode three you know they don't know that that's where mm-hmm. they're from where Miss Minnes is from I don't know <laughs> <laughs> what that would mean but right. yeah but I but I would say yeah I think she's a great character but I would I would say maybe not so much like laser focus in on her i'd say it's more just across all our tva characters you know gotcha what do they know of the tva so (laughs) i you know i saw your lovely instagram post about loki's um bisexuality and and tom had already told me that this was something that was important to you early on and important to him Mm -hmm. um and so i'm just wondering like what you can say about like um your discussions about how you wanted to work that into the script and make sure that it was in there and, and all of that. I know you're proud of it. And I think a lot of people are really happy to see it. So um, I'm glad it's in there. Yeah. So I think for me, it was just about acknowledging it. Cause obviously it's part of who I am. And <laughs> like, so I wanted to talk about it, but um, I think really for us, it, even beyond just me wanting it, it was something the whole team were like really passionate about. And Tom has always been, you know, very passionate about that. And, I think it was just about doing it in the right way. Um, And like I kind of said in my post, like it's, it's a small step because, you know, he's just talking about it. Um, But at the same time, it's a very big step because, you know, I saw some people being like, well, actually for me, this is a massive step for like where I'm from. So I think I was very touched by that, but yeah, I think for us, it was just really important to just sort of like, if anyone asked me, right. I would just be very matter of fact. And I think that was important. And I thought it was written very beautifully by the writers. And yeah, I'm very happy that we have it in there. And because, you know, in, across the comics, like, you know, he's been written as bi, he's been written as pan. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that it was important for us to just, I, I just wanted to bring that to the MCU canon. Happy Pride. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Kate Heron, for chatting with me for so long. I really appreciate you, thank and you. this. And it was a joy for me. And um, yeah, and, and keep catching up on your sleep. Uh, as best yes. you can and uh Hopefully the interviews will slowly improve as i get more sleep <laughs> no you're great you're great and um and uh hopefully i'll get to talk to you again before this is all over yeah it'd be great yeah, yeah. Be, i'm really excited to do interviews once the whole show is oh, out great. and i can be like i can now talk about Just it at, so, answer any yeah. question and not have to think about what am i spoiling yeah totally exactly exactly <laughs> All right, we are back. Do you want to, where, where do you want to start? Do you want to start with vampires? Do you want to start with my all Lokis or Lokis theory or like Miss Minutes? Where do you want to start, Anthony? Uh, let's start with Miss Minutes. Um, okay, so Tara Strong gave an interview last week to THR where she was just sort of saying something like, oh, you know, more is coming for Miss Minutes. And I couldn't tell if it was just like one of those things where it's like, a, at, you know, what is an actor supposed to say? Like, I'm gone for the show forever. Like, you know, of course, more is coming. But a, pu- a bunch of people got like kind of wound up about it. Like, oh my God, is Miss Minutes actually the like mastermind behind it all? And I asked Kate Heron, and she was just sort of, I was like, should we have our, should we be laser focused on Miss Minutes? She's like, eh, you should be focused on everyone at the TVA. So I don't know. I, I don't know if, uh, if Miss Minutes is going to be revealed as our. <laughs> big bad here i mean we think it's kang but like i don't know what what do you think uh could happen with miss minutes the magic castle has this neat trick where uh they have a piano player ghost so you can stand there and you know it's just it's just playing ragtime and you know whatever classic songs classical songs and the fun of that is trying to trip it up say like okay can you play a little bit of uh you know, the New World Symphony by Dvorak and uh, Britney Spears, uh, Hit Me Baby One More Time. And then, like, it does it, so you know that's not pre-recorded in there. And I, you know, there's a a trick behind it, which I won't spoil for people, but it's pretty kind of an obvious one when you ultimately think about it. And I think that's what's going on with Miss Minutes, is that Miss Minutes seems like an automaton, but she is not. That's my guess. That when, when 
she is talking to Loki that that's somebody talking through her. Maybe it's Kang, you know, using a, a way of masking himself. Mm. Maybe it's somebody else. But, like, it's a way of being there but being remote. That's my guess. What do you think? Sure. I like it. Um, I don't know how, like, full sinister I want Miss Minutes to go, but it could be really fun. Um, so we're going to keep our eye on that. Also, um, Mobius, did you clock that Mobius lifted that pen again in Ravana's office? Mm-hmm. Yeah, <sighs> that pen. I'm excited to figure out what's going on with it. The, I think uh, that's where Kid Loki is from. It could be. That's. I think that's what I said uh, mm-hmm. before, but I... Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, what, what is Mobius's connection to that? Do you know? I don't know. Um, Maybe they were in but high is Kid together. Loki, is Kid, Kid Loki from a Midgard high school when he's got Asgardian gear on? I don't know. Like, he's dressed like an Asgardian, is he not? Yeah, he is, but maybe he's come to that? I don't know. Maybe. Um, we also get a mention of vampires. Mobius says that, like, they've, they've pulled in titans and vampires. Um, and that to yeah. me, I think that's like a first mention of vampires in the MCU, uh, which uh, the MCU proper, right? Which um, can only, you know, be laying a brick for Blade to come. Marshall Ali's Blade is coming. Vampires are coming to the MCU. Yeah. Or Morbius? Could it possibly be that? Maybe, but that's that's not Marvel. It's not Marvel Studios. I mean, it's yeah. Marvel, but it's yeah. not. But it's part of the. I guess Spider-Man legacy. So Sony yeah. has it, but then that's kind of tangentially related. Although it's not really clear whether Venom or Morbius would be connected through Tom Holland's Spider-Man. Like that right. hasn't been explicit, right? Right now. I think they're trying to keep those. Yeah. They're trying not to separate. cross those streams. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, exactly. So that seems unlikely. Uh, that was my first thought, but you're right about Blade and Mahershal, Mahershal Ali. That, uh, yeah, he, he is making that movie. So. So, or signed on to play that character. So I think they I think that was a little bit of a lie. Yeah, don't forget about it. Blade. Vampires are coming. Um someone pointed out that A two three uh is Ravana's number, just like B fifteen, C twenty, etc. Um Avengers twenty three is a comic that features King the Conqueror. And it's where Ravana makes her first appearance. So I don't know if that's a nod to that. Yeah, or it's just... got to be an Easter egg, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean either uh, that or a cosmic coincidence. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, someone else pointed out that there are runes on the throne walls, like the in the throne room. That's what I'm calling it, uh, where the uh, animatronic timekeepers are. Could that be why magic doesn't work? Exactly. That's the thought, right? That where you were going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That this is what's blocking magic in the TVA are these runes in the in the throne room. Uh huh. Because it definitely yeah. does not work. We saw, you know, we saw Lady Loki trying to use it, and it's not not happening. So, uh, and of course, Loki himself can't use it. So, I wonder if that's you know a little lesson learned from Agatha. And who would be powerful enough to cast that? You know, that's a question I have. Are you are you trying to bring us back to Mephisto? <laughs> no, no, never, never. I just, <laughs> back to I, Mephisto. I just, uh, I just don't know if like is Kang canonically a sorcerer? Not really, you know. What no, I mean? like, no, he's not. So. so, like, who would who would cast runes like that there? And whoever cast it can still use magic within. So, you know, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I don't know. Have we seen anybody who seems to use magic? Could it be Miss Minutes? Could be. I would love if Miss Minutes is our, our warlock of uh, our, our magic user of this universe you know, is Miss Minutes. Dis- disguising <laughs> herself as this cute little animatron, an- little animated <laughs> clock. It was Miss Minutes all along. I That's love right. it. Um, the other thing, um, so... You know, you've seen, you've you've watched the Loki trailers, right? And you know that there's like there there's that shot of like Loki as like a President Loki, vote for Loki pin sort of thing, where he's sort of shrugging at the camera. Have you seen that mm-hmm. shot? Yes. Okay, so someone on Twitter pointed out that um, all so he's got a bunch of henchmen around him, and you kind of assume that they're just henchmen, but one of them is. That Loki variant from when Mobius was like doing a little holograph zoom through the Loki variant, and one of them had like dark glasses and weird, like a weird jumpsuit. 
and a beard. And I was like, who is, what is that? Who is that? Like, it was such a weird moment for me because I was like, I don't know what reference we're trying to pull here. Um, but someone on Twitter pointed out that that's one of the henchmen behind President Loki in the trailer, which could imply that all of those guys are Lokis. And that, you know, what we're seeing, this pocket dimension is is a dimension where Loki wins the Battle of New York. That's why Avengers Tower is decimated. That President Loki is like that Loki. The Loki is played by Tom Hiddleston, but the Loki who won the Battle of New York, he's got a bunch of Loki henchmen. And our Lokis, our League of Lokis, our kid Loki, our classic Loki, all of that are going to have to like battle those Lokis <laughs> to get out of wherever they are. Um, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on on that? Uh, yes. I think I think it's a good it's a good uh, forecast for where things are going. Um, I mean, I don't know what else to say beyond that. I I, I will I will happily co-sign that theory. I think it's a good one. The idea that Kang is behind everything does bring us back to this um idea that like if there's a sacred timeline worth protecting. It's something that Kang needs to happen. Yeah. And we still don't know what that thing could be. Do you have any thoughts about that? My theory is that disruption, I mean, chaos is where Loki thrives, right? Yeah. And so disruption is, uh, maybe that's some sort of cover or a way to reignite this battle between Kang and the others, or maybe there is, there are no others. Like the notion that there are, is a tribunal that's deciding what is a what is the sacred timeline and what isn't, uh, is a little bit reassuring because there's that sense of like, well, there are multiple people making a decision. It's not just trusted to one person. One person would be a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. So what if behind the scenes, that's why there are these robots that that Kang is, um is orchestrating everything. And, uh, you know, I don't, maybe he is ruling it all. And that's I mean, why I... he's weeding out these good guys, <laughs> these heroes that could stand in his way. Maybe it's like a King Herod thing. Like he's got to get rid of the good Lokis because of, you know, he's aware that they could rise up and unite and take him down. And so he's got to kill them, you know, destroy them, weed them out. Is that so, like, um, like a prophecy thing of like you will be killed by a Loki. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> so he has yeah, to like maybe, maybe yeah. May, I mean, like if there's no past, present, or future, it's out out of time and space. Um, he's gonna go through and say, well, maybe okay. The one thing that defeats me is these Lokis. So let's get rid of them all. Self fulfilling prophecy, man. Or keep um, them focused fighting elsewhere. Yeah, know? yeah. The um. The idea that like uh, the the TVA exists possibly in the quantum realm is something that we've talked about a little bit about, um, but that uh, because the quantum realm time works differently there, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but uh, our listener Christina wrote in and said, "While I'm loving this show and the themes and the great acting, this show more than the previous two, meaning WandaVision, Falcon Winter Soldier, seems to be the most obvious with its laying of groundwork for upcoming movies." Multiverse of Madness, No Way Home, and Quantumania. And I'm not mad at it, just if I think about it too hard, I get a bit cynical. So what do you think about these, like, Disney Plus shows as, like, um, <clears throat> the balance between them being their own thing and laying track for future films, etc.? That's always the struggle, right? Is that the, Does the thing stand enough on its own, or does it is it being used to prop up? as a prologue to future storytelling. And I have to say, I agree. I think there's a lot of foundation laying happening here, but it's kind of like one of those HGTV shows where it's about laying foundations. So this is about establishing the rules of a multiverse. And they've taken a character who's unsettled, who died and we miss, and brought him back and threw him into this, sorted out. So I think this is definitely the kind of stories they're telling, and multiverse is a concept that DC has embraced, and uh, it's really popular because what it does is 
I think, and I've written about this uh, for a story that's coming up soon in the print edition of, of Vanity Fair. Uh, fan bases are unruly right now, and everybody has their own version of what they like, what they don't like. And uh, multiverse is a way to give everybody everything. You can have kid-friendly versions of the characters. You can have grim, dark versions of the characters. You can have mainstream, you know, funny action versions of the characters. And 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 maintain that fan base by saying they're all legitimate because they all interact and all exist in the same universe. And so I think this is just, I think it's breaking ground, not just for future Marvel storytelling, but just establishing a kind of new cinematic language where these characters last for a long time and they exist within us. Like we, we watch them, we consume them. That's the multiverse. All the James Bonds that we like, like we can debate who's the best, but they don't really connect except that we we know them. The audience knows them. They exist in the audience's subconscious together. Otherwise, they're all separate. Um, so I think that's this is kind of a new approach uh, that comic book fans are well aware of, but a new cinematic approach that says, okay, it's not just that we've cast a new Batman and now it's a new bunch of stories, but we're going to say that all of those ones are valid too, and they all interact. They're all part of the same continuum. So, uh, yeah, I think that's kind of... Sorry if that's a long answer. No, it's good. I think Loki's going. Yeah, I mean, this idea, like, when we see this League of Loki show up, it's very, you know, especially since there's, like, a little uh, alligator, crocodile, lizard, Loki over here, right? Um, like, that that can't help but make us think of the Spider-Verse, right? Like, um, yep. With spider, spider ham, spider ham. <laughs> and uh, uh, all of that. So, um, and it, and it has prompted some folks to ask. You know, there's been these rumors. It's not confirmed, but there's all these rumors that Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield are going to show up in the next live action Spider Man film. Um, and so someone was like, "Could they just be variant? Like, are they variants? Like, is, is that what we're going to see? Like, we're going to see spider spider variants?" Um, yeah, I think they are. Yeah, you know, yeah. Or they would be if that. Yeah, if, happen. if if that happens. So like you know, and that's a way in which this is setting up No Way Home, Multiverse of Madness, Quantum. If if the TVA is in the quantum realm, Quantum Mania, like all it's you know Kang, everything. So it's just um, it is interesting to think about these shows in that in that light. Um, it, it is what the MCU has always done, and sometimes it's out of whack, and sometimes it feels seamless. So you know, there you go. You know, and also, I, people who read my work know I'm uh, are really interested in the writings of Stephen King, and he did this with the Dark Tower series. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny, because, like, he would drop these little Easter eggs into his stories, little references to Cujo, or a little reference to the Dead Zone. And then he would have a book like The Stand that ends the whole world. But that, okay, well, that can't exist in the little universe he's created, right? Because the world clearly didn't end in these other books and the ones that came after. And yet he found a way to make it all fit together because all of these different realities exist within the Dark Tower. The Dark Tower is this nexus point between different dimensions and worlds. And, like, that's kind of a cool idea. And I think, I don't know if he was, I would say he came up with it, the idea of a multiverse. But, um, you know, King and and comic books, like, they all kind of, it's sort of like how... uh, the radio and the light bulb was kind of, it was like a race to see who's going to invent it first. You know, <laughs> like everybody's got a society is moving toward it and it's just going to eventually happen. And I think that's where we are in cinematic storytelling is, Oh we, yeah, we like this idea that we can have different flavors of the same character. Um, Josh wrote in this question where he says, um, the show has all these mysteries, right? Who made the TVA? Why kidnap variants to do your grunt work? What outcome is the TVA and their creator attempting to steer the timeline towards? Why are Loki variants so important to the TVA? Given that the show has these mysteries, are there answers that would insufficiently satisfy so as to totally taint the overall show? Even without rapid, rampant fan speculation to heighten expectations, the show is writing some checks that I'm not super confident that it will be <laughs> able to cash. It feels like disappointment in some ways inevitable with things like this. So, I don't know. I love the writing. Up? I love our listeners in their eloquent letters like that's so beautifully put the show is writing writing checks that it cannot cash uh 
that's funny. Yeah, I think that's always the problem with Marvel is that it 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 creates a lot of speculation in the mind of the viewers like us, but then it ultimately has to satisfy the much broader audience of casual fans mm-hmm. who just want the action and the jokes and a little bit of sci-fi and a little bit of mystery, but to have it be resolved in a way that's not too, not going to necessitate them going to the appendix, <laughs> you know, or the index or the glossary. And so, um, yeah, I, I always advocate once we, it's fun to speculate, but I think it's important to remember that Marvel is always going to keep it pretty understandable. And that doesn't always satisfy the people who want the elaborate, gargantuan theories the big brain theories right and like i don't i um i have learned (laughs) in my years of theorizing that like you gotta let go of those theories you gotta be you gotta you gotta hold them loosely in your hand and be ready to let go of them as soon as the tide turns do you know what i mean if only for your own enjoyment sometimes i do find myself like writing a version of the show that maybe i would prefer to watch um you know out of hubris or whatever but like that's that's only gonna impede my own enjoyment of the show and it's just something that i need to learn to like and i think have learned to just sort of like as soon as as soon as they walk into the uh, oh no i'll say this as soon as it's saw richard e grant and his, <laughs> his yellow diaper i was like well i guess he's not the mastermind behind the tva and i just sort of let it go let it float down the stream you know what i mean it's fine um so yeah, are there is there a way it could unsatisfactorily resolve? Absolutely. Of course it could. Like mm-hmm. I think you know, some of the Sharon Carter power broker stuff, even though we saw that coming, like did not feel like a satisfactory end to that series. So, you know, it's like yeah, it could it could, it could drop the ball for sure, but um, you know, so far I'm enjoying it. So, so far I'm enjoying it too. So I'm like I just think it's going to re- resolve itself in a way that simplifies rather than becomes Mind blowing, you know, yeah. All right, we got this email from uh, Rebecca that I really love. That's sort of about Loki's nature in the original Norse mythology, and she writes, "Loki is a trickster, and tricksters traditionally are gods of both destruction and creation. The only reason that Loki is so often portrayed as satanic in Norse mythology is because those written records are from monks. They needed Ragnarok to symbolize the coming of the Christian god, and Loki is the Satan analog who brought it about." But based on everything we know about tricksters in all mythologies, Loki is probably not a villain in his original mythological form. Just another trickster like Raven and Coyote and Eshu and Hermes and Monkey and Prometheus screwing around with the taboos and being agents of chaos and change, messing with humans for their own hedonistic delight, but also siding with them against other gods. Um, I don't know how any of this relates to the comics, and I don't know how deliberate this is in the showrunner's part, but I do think that given this context, the heavy emphasis on Loki as an agent of death and destruction in episode one is setting him up for a shift in his hopefully less burdensome glorious purpose. How perfect would it be if his new purpose is changed? And how wonderful if he ends the show on an act of creation, of unleashing the multiverse of madness. Again, I don't know how deeply the showrunners went into their Joseph Campbell, uh, but it would be incredibly satisfying for me as a viewer if Loki embraced his role as a true god of mischief. Uh, thank you all for the podcast. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, do, I do think it goes back to like that, that Kid Loki comic we were reading, uh, which was such an interesting comic, uh, the one that Michael Waldron had writer recommended, which is about, uh, you know, Loki gets reincarnated in his Kid Loki. He's still Loki. But he's kind of trying to be someone new and he's Mm -hmm. trying to be good and or at least sort of in common cause with his brother and stuff like that. And um, and there's all these people telling him that he's bad, like the like the 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 cycle with Lady Sif in this episode that happens again and again in that comic with like the other warriors, you know, that they're just sort of like Loki, he's a liar, Loki, he's a villain, Loki, he's a this blah, 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 whereas this kid is just like kind of trying to be something else and uh you know that's where waldron said uh was so interesting to him not just because there is a literal kid loki in this tv series we now know but because that loki of like do i have to be what you think i am do i have to be a villain mobius mm-hmm. has a similar line earlier in the season when he talks about like you know change it's in our it's in the <laughs> it's in the opening jingle that dave wrote for this podcast you know what i mean like this idea of change 
uh can he change can he be the hero just for one day as you say like um and so i love this idea that like loki has been cast for hundreds of years as a villain when this idea of being in common cause with humans against the gods a la prometheus is is so interesting to me so i don't know i'm excited i i like it and i'll plagiarize myself a little and say that um i think there are i really believe this and i've written this before like that that people who are told that they're unworthy of love start to believe it especially when they're told at a young age and it makes them lash out makes them sabotage things that are good for them relationships that are healthy when somebody shows you kindness or shows you love and you think you don't deserve it. You really believe you don't deserve it because it's been beaten into you. You, you sabotage, you, you, you undermine it. You do the thing to push the person away. Even if you kind of want that relationship or you want that kindness, you almost can't help it because if that's what you deserve, um, then everything you believe is wrong, but everything you believe is about how bad you are. (laughs) And, and I think it's it creates a, a, a kind of dissonance, and I think it, it leads to a lot of self-destructive behavior. And if that's not Loki, I don't know what is. Love it. Uh, Maureen wrote in and asked, do we, do we think the gator slash croc slash lizard Loki talks? Uh, do we want it to talk? <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think he communicates non-verbally kind of like Groot Groot just says Groot but like you kind of pick up what he's putting down anyway I think there has to be another way for a reptile Loki to communicate if he's going to just be chatting away and we're going to animate the lips of this alligator I don't know that that would work for me so well my hope is that he can talk but only kid Loki can understand him so he can like have a conversation with him yeah uh, that we can only hear one side of yeah (laughs) that would be really fun um yeah, I guess there's also this people keep coming up with these infinity stone theories and I just have to say the way I feel about the infinity stones is that they really only exist in this in this series to show the TVA's power and I don't yeah. love the idea, you know, people thought maybe Loki had palmed one, I think people thought maybe like the the infinity stones had been sort of zapped into one of the pocket dimensions, etc. I don't think that that's uh, that's the case. That's a that's a call I, uh, I'm gonna make. I I agree with you. I think the reason that we see the Infinity Stones in the junk drawer is that this show is telling us we're not using these as a device. We're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, they've done it, so it's like, okay, yeah, these don't work here. Everybody cool. All right, moving on. Uh, do you have anything else you want to say about uh Renslayer, Ravona? I mean, I think she's pretty bad. I think if we don't get uh, Kang the Conqueror necessarily, I think she's turning out to be the villain of the story. I mean, she could be. Like, it, this could be like with Agatha, where we were like looking for the bigger villain, and it was just like, no, it's Catherine Hahn. It's like, no, it's yeah. Gugu, it's Gugu and Batara, which like wouldn't be, you know. I think because we see her as like a uh, like having moved up the ranks, that's why I think she's not the ultimate. Uh, villain, unless she killed the original timekeepers. Maybe. Uh, once upon a time and, uh, replaced them with robots and just carried on business as usual. Uh, but her, her character had a thing with Kang the Conqueror. Yeah. You? Yeah. So. Yes. Absolutely. I'm just saying. Like, I, I'm sensitive to this notion that, like, oh, there, there, does there have to be a bigger villain be, behind her? Not necessarily. I think there's always a bigger villain in Marvel lore, there's always another villain. Uh, who's going to cause problems the next time? And I could see, you know, Kang being sort of a background figure while she becomes the main bad guy. Um, I just have questions about how much they're going to give us Kang in this. Series. Not much. I don't think much. You know, but I think like a tease. Um, yeah. So I think, uh, I think I'm going to read this last <laughs> email is from your variant, uh, Anthony L. Uh, <laughs> wrote in. He called himself that in the email. Uh, he wrote in. Please talk about the apocalypses themselves and connect them to the plot and character development discussions. 
Loki stands out as a show that foregrounds climate catastrophe and the politics of escape in an important way. First, the Alabama storm, then the snow piercer ish train in episode three, where Loki sings about glaciers. Only the rich are getting tickets, right? And then the arc of the rich is destroyed. Maybe Anthony B would be more interested in episode three if he considered the apocalypses as more than background to a personal narrative. Would love to hear your con- you consider these issues before the series ends. And so, like, um, Kate talked about this a bit in the interview that we aired earlier about, like, what their intentions were for the apocalypses. That, like, when you, when we first see Pompeii, um, it's just, it's kind of just a joke. Loki's certainly treating it as a joke. It's just sort of like, oh, uh, ha ha, Pompeii, sort of thing. Then you get a rock star. You're not going to get you know. canceled for that being too 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 soon. You know, <laughs> like, there's nobody nobody saying like, "Hey, man, my my great 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 great." great I mean, great, great, Mo- I mean, died. Mobius is trying. He's like, "Have some decency here, man." But um, but then we get the rock cart apocalypse, and we get a little bit more. Like we get we get Mobius talking about like the his empathy for um these victims, like that they have a lot to fear, but like let's let's not be the thing that they fear, sort of thing, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then you get to this the episode three, that apocalypse. And like, uh, I, I, I kind of agree with you. Like you, you were like, this apocalypse isn't really touching me in the way that I think they want us to want it to. Um, and, and I think you were right because listening to Kate talk about it, she was like, you, sh- you should be really, these should be escalating experiences with apocalypses. And we should be in an apocalypse where in, in episode three, where you're just like, really feeling the full scale dramatic trauma of this. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of, I kind of agree with Anthony Breskin <laughs> that I'm like, I'm not sure I really did feel it the way that they wanted me to in episode three, but I do think it's interesting that, um, yeah, it's like, Oh, this gravel world is going to be destroyed. Like what a tragedy. Well, I mean, <laughs> but, there, but there are people who, you know, there are human beings there, but they're not given a moment where you actually empathize. with. Them. They're just sort of background. Yeah. I think I needed a little bit more, uh, information about the stakes of it like maybe maybe i would have liked the episode more maybe this wouldn't have felt very loki maybe i would have liked the episode more if the lokis were trying to save the the people or something like that rather than just i think you're right i think that's what it actually needed was um because i would have had a question then is obviously their lokis are going to make it but are they going to succeed in helping these people who you know create a character a mother is a compelling character. There was a woman who was like, oh, the, wasn't there a woman sort of jeering them? Like, oh, the rich are getting on this train. Like, it'd be nice if they were going to sneak on and they figured out a way, like, well, let's take a couple of other people with me. Maybe then they'll be all right, you know? And um, wanting to succeed at that and also not succeeding. In the end, maybe they get pulled through the portals and the friends that they're trying to save don't. Yeah, and they and you know the TVA says it doesn't matter. You know we don't. Once even again, have we're to... we're writing the show that we'd like to see rather yeah. than the show. I guess, yeah. I guess. Yeah. But I'm just saying. I think uh, you know. I'm just trying to use an example of like yeah. how I think that could have raised the stakes a little bit more. Like if they, again, it goes back to the thing you and I keep saying, and I've already said once in this episode. Like, give the heroes of Marvel someone to care about, and you're in the the amount you care for them as an audience member goes up. So if there's somebody they're trying to help. And we care about that person too. It, suddenly, that relationship and the character building that uh, that this plot is allowing uh, the the plot that's allowing the character development to, to dangle off of it is um, much more interesting. I can only think that like the reason these apocalypses, apocalypse, whatever, are recurring, um, like I have to wonder if it all does tie back to Ragnarok. Right. Because like, are we building towards something like is the thing that's worth protecting the fact that Ragnarok happens? Does Kang need mm. Ragnarok to happen for some reason? Because mm. like, you know, would these more her- like if 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 you want to interpret it as like Loki brought around about Ragnarok, which you kind of could because he he definitely contributes to Odin's death. <laughs> you know what I mean? And And Odin dying is why. Hella is there and all this sort of stuff like that. Um, if you want to blame Loki, you can. Uh, it's not hard to. But like, it, you know, would these more heroic versions of Loki, this, this Sylvie or boastful Loki or whoever, would they have averted Ragnarok? Um, and in doing so, would that foil something in King's plan? 
I don't know. But I it feels like the apocalypse thing if it, it would be satisfying to me if it were building towards something more than what we've seen so far. Do you know? Yeah, I I I think that would be satisfying too. I think that would be, you know, much more uh interesting and compelling. All right, so fingers crossed for Ragnarok. Um, anyway, I think I think we did it. I think it that brings episode... it home. It brings it home. Too, right? <laughs> you can go back to Ragnarok. Go back to Asgard. I think that's episode four for us. Uh, please do continue to email us stillwashingpot at gmail dot com. Uh, we've got the great uh, Gugum Batara, I believe, on the podcast next week. If all if all goes according to plan. So if you have any questions for her, you can send them my way. Stillwashingpot at gmail dot com. Until next week where we may or may not have a Parisian variant of Richard on the podcast. Uh, <laughs> Anthony Breskin, where can folks find you? You can find me over at VanityFair.com and uh, uh, reiterating to every person I meet on the street that we care about Marvel characters because they care about other people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can find me on VanityFair.com. You follow me on Twitter at Joe Wrote This. And uh, I'm excited for what we're going to find out from... Uh, classic loki i mean if the rest of the series is just richard e grant you know rule run in the joint i will have no problems with it so uh so here we go we'll see you all next week bye